perfect, brilliant, wonderful. So I would like to start with an introductory statement that comes from uh, recent work that Rafaela and I have been working on and uh, that sort of summarizes the key theme of today's session. Numbers and graphs. Numbers and graphs are two essential modes of scientific communication, complementing, evidencing and underscoring information presented in text. While numbers help us quantify reality and bring precision to scientific discourse, the primary role of data visualization is abstraction, highlighting main trends in a data set. So we'll be talking about numbers and uh, a lot about graphs as well and how to transform these numbers into graphs and how to do this in a practical, practical way. So whatever your data set, whatever uh, the corpus you are using or corpora you are using, you'll be able to hopefully benefit uh, from this session. So let me demonstrate with some examples this sort of theoretical statement that we started, started with. Here's a line of numbers and we can sort of observe that they are sorted from the smallest to the largest. But when we look at the numbers as, as, as these, uh, we might not be immediately able to see the pattern in there. As I said, numbers are about precision, about giving us information about our data when we measure, for instance, frequencies in corpus linguistics. If I add visualization, a very simple visualization for that matter, uh, to this uh, set of numbers, just this simple line, you will be able to see what the trend is in the data. There's a growth and steady growth, a linear growth, as, as we would say, uh, in, in this data set. Of course, this is a made up data set, so that's why the line is nice and smooth. And obviously, I can also add a graph to that so that you can see the full context of this visualization. So this was a made up example just to illustrate the fact that we are dealing with numbers for precision and visualization graphs are for understanding the overall overarching patterns in our data. At least this is our understanding and it would be interesting to know what your understanding of data visualization is. Let's look at a real example uh, from corpus linguistics from historical corpora that relates to the emergence of empirical science in the 17th century. If you know a bit of history of science, you know that many important discoveries were made in the 17th century, including some important tools that enabled those discoveries, such as microscope, telescope, and thermometer. All of these tools were discovered around, around, around that time. What I'm showing here in this, uh, in, in this slide is a simple graph, a line graph, uh, that demonstrate the frequencies of these uh, tools in the corpus, in a very large corpus of preserved body of the 17th century writing. I'll provide a bit of a context for this and also a bit of a context for the graph. So as I said, in the 17th century, a number of new scientific discoveries were made as empirical science emerged. These discoveries were enabled by the invention of scientific tools such as the telescope, microscope, and the thermometer. The mentions of part of here around the middle of the 17th century, peak 1692. What I'm going to do with this graph is I'm going to integrate it in the text, just in the parentheses after the last piece of information. This is an example of a line graph that we call a spark line a very useful form of uh, scientific presentation where hundreds different uh, points of data are summarized in a tiny, tiny graph that is uh, of a size of a word, of a single word that can fit very easily in uh, our text, in our scientific report, if you like. So here's a real example of how the visualization can support our understanding of uh, historical 
discourse and scientific discourse in particular. So speaking of tools, uh, in today's session, we will be presenting some useful tools for data visualization. And the main tool that will be presented today and Rafaela will be guiding you through the practical session through the process of uh, learning how to use this tool in a practical sense is the graph tool, which is part of a larger package that we call Lancaster Stats Tools Online. This package operates online. I will give you the URL in a, in a moment. And uh, you can just copy paste your data, click a button and get the right type of answer for statistics. But in this particular case, we'll be producing different types of graphs uh, suitable for different types of corpora corpus data. So uh, this is the tool that we are offering today as our main tool in the in the session. But we will be really interested in your thoughts and your experiences with the tools that you previously used, if any, and obviously we don't assume any knowledge in this webinar, but if you use any of those tools, could you now join us uh, and join this uh, virtual poll at slido.com if you type in this web address to your browser and then use the password the graphs you should be able to see our first poll part in the poll and join uh, and join us and share share some experience uh, with the tools that you are familiar with already and i'm going to ask rafaela whether she could take over now and uh See whether we can see whether we have some early early results coming in as we speak now. Yes, thank you, Vaslav. So I'll just share my screen with you. Uh, I think it will stop your sharing, so you have to resume it, resume it later on. Okay. So we can see that uh, we have some of some votes in already, and we have uh, some tools already listed here. So uh, some of the most common tools. And we have 46, about 50 participants now voting. Um, I just want to remind you that you can select more than one option. And it seems like Excel uh, or spreadsheet software uh, are the most used, is the most used tool to display uh, statistical data. And then we have RStudio, um, graph call at Langsbox, and that's great. We uh, hosted a webinar on Langsbox uh, for Lancaster uh, Summer School in Corpus Linguistics, so uh, it's great to see that it's popular for visualization of data as well. And then we have SPSS, SPSS other uh, tools, Lancaster Stats tools online, and somebody 5% uh, of the voters use JASP. So the votes are changing slightly and we have 64 votes so far, but more or less, this is the trend. Yeah, so I'll stop sharing Brilliant. my screen. Brilliant, I'll jump, 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 jump in and uh, share this, uh, this, this, this screen. So uh, it is great to see sort of a variety, a range of tools uh, that we can use and obviously it depends on the shape of your data, but it also depends on whether you are a beginner or whether you are a more uh, experienced corpus linguist and user of these, these tools, because some of them uh, are more complicated, more complex, but also more powerful. So there's always, always some, some sort of a trade-off, but it is wonderful to have this type of uh, insight and this type of background. So thank you so much for taking part in uh, this uh, quick, quick poll. What I would like to do now, before we move to the first practical part, is to just offer some underlying principles and look at some key questions about uh, data visualization and corpus linguistics. The first key question is, where do we start? We think, oh, we have a corpus, we have our data, we have our research question, but how do we transform that information into something that is visual, that is also useful from the scientific point of view. So let me just outline the situation when we think about corpus data. 
one thing and crucial thing to realize is that corpus data is multi-dimensional in many, many different aspects. So we have dimensions such as speech and writing, formal and informal. We have speakers who are young and old, male and female. We have different genres and registers such as newspapers, fiction, academic writing, but also emerging genres, blog posts, tweets, or the online genres. We have historical data, uh, and I've seen, uh, I've shown you some, some data from uh, the 17th century writing, but we have, have also present today uh, language data that we can analyze. We have speakers who are native speakers, L1 speakers of a, of a particular language, and we have also speakers who have, uh, who speak English or other languages as their additional languages. So that all presents some sort of uh, variation that we have in the data. And there's many more, many more dimensions, many more areas of variation in language. So we are dealing with a multidimensional uh, phenomenon that we call language. And the challenge is to transform and interpret the multi-dimensional phenomenon within uh, two dimensions of a graph on a screen or on a printed page. I borrowed the term flatland. This is the term that uh, Edward Tufte uses uh, for the reality of uh, the blank canvas on which we project our visualizations. And all of these canvases, electronic or paper-based, are two-dimensional. So we have to reduce the multidimensionality of language to this flatland of our screens and uh, produce graphs that are useful. So that involves a certain amount of abstraction. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to understand what is, what is going, going on. So let me give you a real example from early science. Uh, I mentioned the 17th century, and 17th century was especially uh, fruitful in terms of scientific discoveries. And this is an early discovery by Galileo, who in December 1609 and January 1610 observed the moons of Jupiter, made notes about that, and then sort of produce the scientific visualization that you can see in the last line of this paragraph. The uh, circle in the, uh, in, in the visualization is Jupiter and the stars around it uh, are the moons that he was able to observe using his improved telescope. Uh, he still sort of labeled these as stellae, so that the sort of stars uh, in, in, that, in that terminology. Of course, you know, we can confirm this observation nowadays very easily using Hubble's telescope and, you know, uh, other, other uh, more precise scientific methods. But that in observation and that initial uh, scientific presentation of the observation still holds nowadays. So this is a very, very good example of an effective use of scientific visualization that we can learn from also in corpus linguistics. So let's think about corpus linguistics and how we can uh, apply some of these lessons to corpora and corpus data. So well, let's think about corpora. What is a corpus and how would you visualize a corpus? Let's imagine that we have a corpus of the Brown family size. So one million words, BO6 is a uh, corpus of Current written British English, one million words of different genres and registers. And the question is, how would we present that and how would we visualize uh, that data set? Obviously, you might think of, well, you know, corpus consists of texts of different, different size. In this case, we have uh, texts of different genres and registers. Each is a sample of 2,000 words and we have 500 of them. But the corpus also consists of individual words. So maybe our visualization can be a sort of string of words or one, one, one million of those uh, to be able to actually see that uh, we have a sort of a linear representation of the data in some, some way. Or we might think of more of a container, a different type of container. 
uh, box, uh, a pyramid, or, or, or a sphere that would actually allow us to visualize the volume of the data that we have and perhaps compare it with other corpora as well. One thing to remember about scientific uh, visualization is that it is always relative to the purpose that we use and uh, to what we need to do, do with that. So a very quick example here, if we want to co compare our BO6 corpus uh, with other corpora, and uh, we, we can actually offer this type of visualization. So here's the 1 million words, here's 100 million words, uh, corpus of the size of the British North. Here's a size of a uh, corpus that uh, would be uh, comparable to uh, COCA, the American corpus uh, of the current, current American English, or uh, the Bank of English, uh, the Birmingham corpus uh, of, uh, of British, British English. And when we think about corpora nowadays, the corpora are so large, they wouldn't actually fit the screen, and we would have to take a step back to fully appreciate the size of the data. One of the largest corpora I've ever used was a 20 billion uh, word corpus based on internet sources. So again, we can compare and contrast the amount of data that we have in different types and sizes of corpora. So what can we see in the data? That's the sort of second guiding question and just some uh, very quick examples. So the most, the simplest form of visualization is a table. Here's a table coming from corpus research, uh, summarizing the uh, association measures, different association measures and different collocations that we can uh, observe in different parts of the uh, British National Corpus compared to uh, another, another corpus. The details are not important. What is important is that when you look at this table from a distance, it is very hard to read. So it has all the important pieces of information. However, they are not presented in the most helpful fashion. Well, you know, you can put this table into Microsoft Word and get a sort of a fancy color uh, uh, version of the, of the same table. But in this case, it might help slightly, but it wouldn't help you very much to get a sense of what is going on in the table. My preference in this particular case would be the third transformation. It's a transformation that sort of tries to simplify the table above and just highlight the dimensions that are really important for the table. We have different uh, corpora and we have different associations and different collocations there. And if we want to use color, it might be a good idea to use color for something that is scientifically important such as uh, uh, highest frequencies or highest values of the association measure in this particular case uh, in each line. So in this way, we can actually uh, very easily spot the most important collocations in the table. So some kind of a minimalist approach where we can uh, highlight the important features, but not hide it uh, behind all these fancy features that some, some tools might present, present to us. What I would like to do is also draw some examples of visualization that we've encountered when we develop the tool that some of you are familiar with, according to the poll, and that's called Langsbox tool uh, for uh, analyzing and visualizing corpora. When we started with Langsbox, Langsbox version one, the concordance tables looked like, like that. Very rudimentary and it was somewhat similar to the first table I showed you in the previous slide. So there was a lot of clutter and not enough focus on what really matters in corpus linguistics. And that's the words, the phrases, the concordance lines that we can actually observe the patterns of language that are so important to us. So in later versions, what we did, we got rid of the clutter and just highlighted what the most important features are in language, being able to see the words, 
and their co-occurrences highlighted in color. Uh, again, something that is meaningful from the scientific, linguistic point of view. Another example coming from graph call, uh, from the Langsbox tool, is the display of collocations. Traditionally, collocations were displayed in a table, in a tabular format, uh, collocates of a particular words. In this, uh, in, this, in this example, we are looking at collocates of time, and obviously the appropriate uh, statistics, MI score in this, in, this, in this case. In graph call, we went one step further and devised graphs that can actually display this type of relationship. In our thinking about how to display these graphs through from dimensions to multi-dimensions, again, going back to the idea of multi-dimensionality uh, of, uh, of data in corpus linguistics. So here's our initial graph in early version of Lang's box, version two, where we have the node, the search term, time in the middle, and we have the collocates around it. The arrows, the edges of the graph, represent the strength of the collocation. The shorter the arrow, the stronger the collocation. Imagine the word time being a magnet attracting the collocates toward the center of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the graph. And the collocates are around the most important, important ones. So you can immediately spot the strength of the collocation. But however, in this version, that's the only dimension that is displayed in the graph. As I said, we've developed in our thinking, so we went one step further. And again, in the next version of the tool, we displayed not one, but three dimensions in this, in this graph. We still have the strength of collocation by the length of uh, the link between uh, the node word in the middle and the collocket, but we also have uh, fancy. So with MI score in this case, that is the length of the, of the link, but we have the frequency of the collocation itself that is displayed by the intensity of the color of the collocate. So for instance, at, as a grammatical word, is much more frequent in combination with time than uh, the word lost or spent or bad. So again, you can see that immediately. The third dimension in the graph is the pos positionality of the collocates. We know that some collocates appear predominantly before the node, and some collocates uh, appear predominantly after the node, and some appear somewhere, you know, sometimes before, sometimes after. In this graph, the position of the collocates in the graph reflects the exact middle position of the collocate in text. So we know that, for instance, first, short, same, at, precedes time, whereas ago follows time in the expressions of some time ago. So again, this gives us more insight into the data, and arguably this is a richer representation of the collocation of relationship. And finally, here we have a graph call that in addition to all these dimensions, as the whole dimension that is indicated by the color of uh, those collocate terms, and you might be able to spot that these are color code coded according to the grammatical categories of these. So adjectives, for instance, are green, uh, verbs are uh, red, add as a grammatical term is, is yellow and, and so on, uh, blue are nouns. So just looking at this graph from a distance, we can actually see immediately uh, what, is, what is going on. And again, this is the important dimension that we talked about, and this is the abstraction. We can see and visualize the most important relationships and most important features of the data through uh, graphs such as these. So just to give you some more examples, and then Rafaela will take over and guide you through uh, some questions that hopefully you uh, uh, you, you'll be able to look at and, and give us some, some thoughts on that as well. So here are some more examples, so bad, that we use in corpus links. So types of graphs can be used. Before we do that, have another, we have another poll here 
Uh, and again, if you could go back to the Slido page, you might need to refresh it. And uh, there should be a, uh, another, uh, another poll for you that asks you about different types of graphs. Again, Rafaela, if you could uh, take over uh, once we are getting some of the early, early results when people have time to, uh, to uh, share their experience with different uh, gra uh, graph types. And then we are going to look at some of these uh, from the theoretical, more theoretical perspective. So, Rafael, over to you. Thank you. So, again, I've just activated the poll and the first votes are coming in. I'll just share my screen and see what the results are so far. And as with the previous poll, you have some, um, some options that you can select. And at the moment, we have 55 voters. So at the top, we've got bar graphs. 84% of the participants have selected that. 60% of the participants pie charts. And obviously, since participants, since voters can select more than one option, we don't have a total of 100. Um, but uh, it looks like bar graphs and pie charts are the most uh, frequent statistical graphs and then histograms, box plots, scatter plots, error bars are at the very end with just 5%. Okay. So it looks like this is the uh, outcome. So I'll stop sharing my screen with you. Brilliant, and I switch to my screen now. So thank you so much, Rafaela, and thank you so much for sharing your experience with you. And obviously, bar charts, by bar graphs, are seem to be the most popular types. They've been used very successfully in linguistics, in the uh, types of research. So let's think about these graphs and how we evaluate their uh, relative value for uh, corpus visualization. And again, these are some of the guidelines, but again, you know, there might be also personal preferences that people have and that's absolutely all right. So let me share my experience with different types of graphs, starting with pie charts, which were also one of the popular uh, uh, types of graphs in your, in, your, in your answers. So here's a pie chart and I have them classified, not entirely, uh, uh, as bad examples, but this particular example is bad. And I, I, I'm just wondering whether uh, you would be able to spot the problem with this particular example, with this particular use of uh, pie charts. I'm not saying that pie charts are bad in general, but this particular use has some problems. Obviously, various tools allow you to uh, apply various fancy features of pie charts. They can look like that, or even a proper pie like that, the same, same data set. We are looking at student opinions, 33% uh, uh, disagree and 67% agree with a particular uh, with a particular statement, let's say. Can anyone spot, spot the problem? Well, if we present just uh, percentages, the problem might be that they might hide the actual underlying data. And in this case, the same pie chart would apply if uh, Three students were interviewed, 30, 300 or 3,000 students were interviewed because the percentages would add uh, uh, to, to, to this as well. In addition, the pie chart takes up quite a lot of space and in this particular case just displays two values, two numbers, 33 and 64. So maybe there might be other useful ways of presenting the data and certainly presenting the way, data in such a way that doesn't hide the real underlying patterns and the amount of evidence that we have in our data, in our core group. So let us look at some other examples. These are very uh, popular examples. And again, I have classified them as not that great examples. I'll explain why I think this might be the case. These are the examples from uh, Google Engram Viewer, where you can uh, type in a particular word or phrase and uh, you get uh, the frequencies across time starting 1800 to 2000. Uh, in this particular chart I'm looking at the word immigrants and there seems to be a end of growth in the Google 
and grun merge. Uh, these types of crops are very popular in uh, a type of uh, linguistic and cultural pursuits that is uh, called cultural nomics. And you can see graphs like uh, these ones uh, in published work, and even a graph like this one that looks at uh, uh, the uh, frequencies in different parts of the world. So maps, maps things on, onto, onto a map uh, using the available uh, evidence on the internet, such as the Google, Google books. One of the problems with these graphs is that they are rather difficult to interpret from the corpus linguistic perspective. We don't have access to the underlying corpus and we don't know the structure of the corpus precisely. And we know that genres and registers have developed over uh, the historical period of time. So uh, we are dealing with a slightly different composition of the corpus. And we also uh, don't have access uh, to the examples to be fully, uh, to be able to fully uh, appreciate and interpret uh, interpret uh, those uh, those frequencies. So, for instance, the first graph that I showed you, the the graph that was looking at immigrants. Well, there seems to be a, a rise, a sharp rise in the naming strategy. But think about the other terms that people might have used in the 1800s uh, to, to, to label people who we would now nowadays label as immigrants, pilgrims, uh, uh, people who come from different different parts parts of, 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 of the world. So uh, the naming strategies change and the culture changes and shifts. So just tracing the frequencies of a single form might not be as helpful as it might appear at first. Here are our favorite bar charts. I'm displaying three corpora and comparing them. Bar charts are okay. I have them in the okayish category. Uh, the only slight issue with bar charts is that uh, they take up a lot of space and display, in this case, three values. So we have a lot of space taken up by three values. These are the mean values in each of the corpus. A perhaps useful alternative to bar charts could be uh, a graph that we call a box plot. Uh, this is the same data as the previous slide, three corpora. But in this case, we are looking inside the corpora and we are able to appreciate the distribution of the values inside the corpora. We have the maximum and the minimum value in each corpus. These are the whiskers uh, that stick out uh, of each of those boxes. We have also uh, the interquartile range, the 50%, uh, the middle 50% of values in each of the corpus. And we also have the median, the middle value, uh, and we have the outlier in corpus three. We can enhance the graph and add more pieces of information. This is again, the same data set. In this case, we also map the individual points. These are the individual speakers or individual texts in the corpus and we've added the mean value. So we have the median, we have the mean, and in this particular graph, instead of three pieces of information, we suddenly have 36 pieces of information, which seems to be richer from the perspective of uh, scientific communication. And it, it tells a sort of uh, a more complex story than a simple bar chart could. Here's our collocation networks, and I've already mentioned these in more detail. So uh, I'm just uh, having this here as a reminder of a potentially useful form of visualization of collocations. I've already mentioned sparklines, and here's another example of the use of sparklines in two sentences uh, in the 17th century, looking at different naming strategies for prostitutes, poor, harlot, prostitute, and again, the, the, uh, the, the sparklines giving us uh, an overview of 100 points in each case and the development of uh, the relative frequencies of these words and the naming strategies in the 17th century. We can also use maps to uh, plot frequency data from corpora and this is called geomapping and we'll have some examples of geomapping in the practical session as well. Here I'm looking at the places, top 10 places, that people from the British national corpus go or travel to. Obviously London is the top, top one the size of the dot is proportional to the frequency 
of uh, that place in relation to where people go or travel to, uh, in, as, as mentioned in the corpus. Uh, we have places in the UK, but outside of the UK, we have Paris, Rome, and New York, as you can immediately see uh, from, from the map, uh, if you know your geography. And again, uh, we are talking about you know, various options in uh, looking at relationships between data. We have scatter plots and regression lines to see the relationship between two variables in the data, and relationships are really crucial for scientific visualization and display. And uh, on the right, we have a complex correlation matrix. Again, uh, we can see uh, the positive and negative correlations, color coded, and these are correlations between multiple different linguistic variables. The details are not important. This is just to suggest that there are many different types of visualization that we have at our disposal corpus linguistics. And I'll stop here with the theoretical part and we'll ask Rafaela uh, to guide you through some of the uh, key questions about evaluating graphs when we look at them. And again, bear in mind these sort of theoretical underpinnings we've been talking about and try to apply these uh, to the examples that we will share with you. So over to you, Rafaela. Thank you, Václav. I've just copied in the chat box the links where the participants can download the handout for this webinar and we'll be using it for these first practical session and also for the next one later on. So I'll just share my screen to show you the link where you can get the handout in case you have problems downloading it from the chat box or getting the link from the chat box. So uh, you should be able to see my screen now. And on the left side of the screen, you have the link where you can download the handout. I'll just show you where. So uh, if you type this link into your browser, you get to uh, this website on the right side of my screen. Uh, you'll see the references that we've been using to prepare this webinar. And this is the website for using the Lancaster Stats tools online. If you click on materials at the top, and have a look at the first section, the chapter one, the introduction, and then click on exercises. Then you find the handout, the PDF of the handout uh, under data visualization. So uh, if you have issues clicking on the link in the chat box, you can always use this um, web, uh, web page, web link on my screen and download your handout from here. So once you download the handout, uh, you should be able to see the first task that we'll do now. So the, um, this practical session has uh, mainly two aims. So in this first step, we'll discuss together how we can improve two graphs thinking especially about all the features that Vaxlav has highlighted in the, in the presentation, thinking about the good and bad examples of visual displays of data. And if you have questions, uh, you can write them in the chat box. Or um, if you have, uh, if you find that my uh, screen takes a bit too long, remember that the webinar is being recorded, so you can always access um, the video recording later on and go through the steps of the practical session again at, a, at your own pace. So uh, in this first step, in this first practical session, we'll look at page one of the handout that you can see now on my left, left side of the screen and uh, we'll work on the warm-up activity while later on in the second part of the practical session we'll actually use the graph tool and we'll create graphs together and see how we can interpret them. So first of all here in the warm-up activity you have two examples of visual display of statistical data and I'd like to I'd like you to have a look at them think about the uh, yeah. pros and cons of these and uh, think about how you could improve the following, uh, these two visual displays. You can write uh, your ideas in the chat box and I'll be uh, reading out some of your answers. 
I'll just give you a few seconds to look at these. Think about what works well and what could be problematic. Thinking about the interpretation of these um, graphs and how effective they might be or not. For example, in a report. So we have some answers already, some ideas in the chat box. And somebody mentioned the fact that colors um, are not used in a meaningful way. And that's, uh, that's a very good point. So if we look at the word cloud first, so focusing on the first visual display, the word cloud is representing the concept of social media. But as um, Huang uh, mentioned in the chat box, the colors actually are not linked to any uh, frequency band or any semantic field. So they don't, they don't add any value. Yes, so somebody in the chat box mentioned low frequency words. Uh, that are not obvious. So word clouds are based on the idea of frequency and they might, they can be intuitive. So we can uh, see that the largest, the biggest words are the most frequent ones, but actually it's difficult to see the low frequent words, the small ones, because of the small fonts. Any other idea? So the word cloud, uh, Pauline mentions the fact that the word cloud uh, can includes also um, grammar words, function words, and sometimes we're just uh, interested in content words. So depending on your research question, that might be uh, a disadvantage if you want to just extract content words. And also, it's not very precise if you think about it. Uh, we know that the largest words are the most frequent ones, but we, we don't have uh, any precise frequency value. And also if we wanted to, uh, for example, identify the 10 most frequently, frequent items in these word cloud, making a list that would take time and it wouldn't be very precise or easy. And yes, somebody mentions the position, Tony, the position of the words in the word cloud uh, it doesn't carry any meaning. Great. So what about the second visual display? What are the possible issues with interpreting these graphs? Zainab mentions the fact that some flags and might not be familiar to all the readers and uh, that's a very good point. So it might be difficult to recognize them, especially uh, if you think about printing these graphs in black and white, we might lose some information. And if you're bad at geography as I am, you might, it might take some time for you to recognize some of these flags. Yes, again, the color of the bars is meaningless. Thank you, Nikita. And the proportion of each of speakers for each country is not displayed. So we have the most spoken languages of the world, uh, but we don't have precise values for each country. And uh, yes, a good point. The font is also a bit uh, small, so um, it is a bit difficult to read details about the languages on the left side and uh, the statistical values on the right side of the bars. So. Yes, this gives, gives us uh, some ideas of possible issues with uh, graphs. And I'll hand, I'll hand you back to Vaclav now for an overview of the key principles of effective visualization of data before uh, going on with the second practical uh, session and using the graph tool together. So thank you uh, for your feedback and for your ideas in the chat box. And back to you, Vaclav. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Rafaela. Just I'm switching back to my screen. And uh, 
very interesting ideas in the in the in the chat box, and you guys were able to spot precisely uh, what the what the issues were with these uh, uh, very nice and fancy forms of presentation, which very often appear in the newspapers, but they might not be as useful for the scientific. Uh, visualization and scientific presentation of the data. So what I would like to do now very briefly is to give you some tools that would help you evaluate uh, and measure the success of a particular visual display in terms of scientific presentation. And again, this always depends on the function of the graph. If the, if the function of the graph is to sell newspapers, obviously, you know, the more color, the better. But if the function is to display something useful about the data and use it, for instance, in a serious research report, PhD thesis, uh, published article, then we might like to think about this carefully and critically. So here are some tools uh, how we can actually uh, evaluate uh, different forms of visual presentation. So two basic principles here that I would like to mentioned in relation to good visualization. Focus on content, comparison, and causality. And this is really crucial because these three keywords, content, comparison, and causality, are the essential aspects of science. We want to look at data, and empirical science is based on data, so the content is what the uh, empirical data tell us, or the corpus tells us in our particular context as corpus linguists. We also want to compare and contrast because without comparison, we don't have a baseline. Think of a number, uh, 300. Is it a large number or is it a small number? We don't know unless we compare it to some form of a baseline. Causality, this is the ultimate goal, hopefully, of any scientific pursuit, to be able to derive and uh, see and prove causal links between different events in nature and in society also, uh, although sort of social science is much more complex because there are so many different factors, uh, contextual, speaker-based, uh, and individual in our uh, use of language. Uh, there's a very nice summary, uh, informal summary, by Edward Tufte, who says, if a picture isn't worth a thousand words, the hell with it. And it's a sort of a you know, very critical point that, that he uses just to highlight the importance of these three key aspects of good scientific visualization. If a picture doesn't provide those, then we might as well not use it. The other point that I would like to highlight and then expand on is the high data in ratio. Uh, and again, with Tufti, uh, I would say above all else, show the data. So one of the key issues, and I'll expand on the, the idea of data ink ratio and give you some examples. But again, the crucial thing to remember in scientific presentation, as opposed to you know different other forms of presentation, uh, when you think about artistic forms of presentation or presentation in the newspapers and uh, in adverts and, and, and so on and so forth. They have slightly different purposes and very different purposes in many, many cases. But for scientific uh, purposes of data presentation, we really want to see the data. We really want to show the data and show the, show the content because this is really what matters and which actually can either support our theories or refute our theories. So this is really very, very important. And the single most important thing about scientific visualization is to show data. Here's an example, uh, example of a poll question uh, that uh, has plagued British politics since the referendum in 2016. This is the referendum about Britain uh, uh, leaving the European Union. Uh, this is one form of presentation in a newspaper, a British tabloid, a popular newspaper, uh, just before the 2016 referendum. And the, the question asked in the poll was, should Britain leave EU? And this was just an informal poll before, uh, before the referendum. Uh, what you can see in the background is the picture 
of Barack Obama and David Cameron, uh, US President and uh, British Prime Minister at that time in 2016. And we have this bar chart here. Well, when you think critically about this bar chart and think about this from the perspective of scientific presentation of the data and what really matters, if we hide anything that doesn't relate to the data, we might end up just with a question and two numbers, these two percentages. And the whole visualization behind it takes up a lot of space, which could uh, be as efficiently expressed by uh, a single sentence, such as the poll shows almost a tie within the sort of margin of statistical error, 45% for Brexit, 41 against him. Obviously, we know how the referendum results uh, tend, tend out in, in the end. But again, just to demonstrate the principle of if the scientific visualization is rich enough in terms of the data content, then we might as well not use it and think of alternative forms of expressing the same idea, same proposition, the same context, such as a sentence. Okay, so what we are trying to advocate here is some form of a minimalist approach uh, to data, trying to remove redundancies that clutter uh, the picture. Again, going back to our initial idea of obstruction, where we want to obstruct, we also want, want to extract from the individual points, but we also want to obstruct from some of the redundancies that clutter the picture. So again, when we look at this as an example of a bar chart, and this is a real bar chart, I, uh, looked up the word love in the British National Corpus, and there are uh, uh, many, many instances, 22,265 uh, instances of the word love in the 100 million word corpus, which is a nice, nice number. Uh, the form of presentation here as a, as a bar chart offers us the opportunity to actually so explore some of the redundancies here. So we have the one view that is expressed in seven different ways in the bar chart uh, in many, many different redundant forms. But when we think about it, we can look at uh, the uh, height of the slope and the, uh, of, of the bar, rather, and uh, the left-hand side of the bar, the right-hand side of the bar, we have the color that also shows us the height of the bar. We have the uh, top uh, of the of the bar, and we have also the position of the number, not the number itself, but the position of the number that is uh, sitting just on top of that to mark a uh, uh, single single value. We also have the axis, the y-axis, that shows us where the value is with the number related to the y-axis, and finally the seventh is the number itself, the value of the number itself. So when you think about this bar chart. There are multiple redundancies. Uh, so we use a lot of space to display a single piece of information, and that's the frequency information. Again, if we are competing for space, and it's not only uh, the fact that you know, in printed uh, research reports, we don't have that much space, and there's a limitation of the space, because online we have virtually unlimited space, but we are also competing for the mental space of our readers. Think about it. We want to present what is most important, to highlight the main pattern. So we don't want to clutter the space with things that are redundant and potentially not that important. And we want to leave the space and the mental, mental space of our readers uh, in particular uh, for, for, for the most, most important features in our data and in our research. So here comes the principle that I have already mentioned and that Stati's principle uh, of data in ratio. Actually, a formal way of calculating how successful in terms of the information content a particular form of visualization is. So data in total in use uh, to print the graphic. Think of a printer, uh, just sort of an inkjet printer, if you like, uh, 
that you are printing your your images on uh, at, at home your graphs graphs on and the the ink the physical ink actually this is a metaphor but the physical ink it takes to uh, print that type of visualization the best way to actually approach this is to show you two examples one arguably less successful than the other in terms of the data we take so here's an example that i've created uh, this is a uh, scatter plot uh, on the x-axis i plotted the frequencies of the definite article the and on the y-axis i plotted the frequencies of the first person pronoun i uh, i used the uh, the obvious tool very often for many people the go-to tool which is microsoft excel and created this graph excel excels uh, in creating these very nice colorful images but sometimes also lets us down when we think about the uh, scientific visualization. The first thing you might have noticed is uh, the immediate redundancy that we can see in the caption and then the title of the graph. The same, same piece of information is repeated twice here um, because Excel by default invites us to label, label, label the graphs above and obviously in a scientific research report we would also caption the, the 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 images so that creates this immediate redundancy but what is more important is for us to look at how we would calculate the data in ratio here so imagine that this is printed uh, on a page a4 page and uh, the size of the graph is about 10 centimeters it is a square so 10 times 10 centimeters so let's plug in the numbers into our data in ratio equation. So first of all, the data ink. So uh, the ink that was used to present the information, scientific data. Here we have 64 different points, 64 different texts in this corpus. Uh, half a centimeter each, these are squares. So these are the points in the middle that represent our data, data ink. Um, and we divide this by the total size of uh, the graph here because the graph is colored, uh, covered, covered, covered with color, the whole thing. So 10 times 10. So we get 16 over 100, which is 0 0.16, a low number because the data ink ratio ranges from zero, uh, very low scientific content or no scientific content actually, to one, which is a high, high scientific scientific content and successful uh, visualization in terms of uh, data in a ratio if we take this as our measure. In this case, 0.16 is a fairly, fairly low number, very low number, I would probably say. So take the same data set and let's present it in a slightly different way. This uh, data presentation was taken from the graph tool that Rafaela in a moment will uh, show how to operate and uh, the same data set that uh, actually in addition to uh, the individual points also offers us the speaker codes or text codes so we can actually see which text falls uh, into which category and uh, how the frequencies are distributed among the individual text that we can identify in the data so again uh, we provide richer uh, type of information in this in this graph. When we plug the numbers in, data uh, in ratio, uh, we get something like 0.93. So again, we don't use the color for the background, so that saves lots of lots of ink and allows us to mentally focus on what is important. That's the data points and the main trend that is expressed uh, by the regression line that goes through the middle of the data cloud. We might be even able to improve this graph slightly because we have the, the two axes and we don't know, need the whole box. So we can even sort of delete this. And if we want to, uh, you know, even increase the data in ratio and give uh, our readers the most important uh, features, focus on the data rather than the focus on the clutter around around the data. So that's one of the tools that we have. And uh, 
uh, one of the important tools. I'm not suggesting that we should compute data ink ratio as I did in these two examples. This is just to exemplify the idea. But hopefully, uh, by now, you should be able to see immediately when you look at a graph with a critical eye whether this graph is more or less successful in terms of uh, data presentation from the scientific point of view. So let us look at some of the graphs that we offer as part of our graph tool and uh, we sort of tried really hard to make them as useful as possible uh, from corpus linguistic perspective but also from the perspective of successful scientific presentation. So now I would invite Rafaela again to take over and guide you through the second practical part of this webinar. Thank you, Václav. So uh, I've again uh, shared with the participants uh, the link to download the same handout that we were using before. And I'll now just uh, share the screen with you and guide you through our practical session. So the aim of this second practical session is to try out graph tool and to see how we can create graphs and visual displays of statistical data uh, using the Lancaster Stats tools online. Uh, so you have, you'll find all the instructions in the handout, which is on, my, on the left side of my screen. Um, I hope you can see it from here. And uh, if you, uh, well, you, you should be able to download the handout following using the link that I shared in the chat box. Uh, as, again, as with before, uh, if you have any question, feel free to ask them in the chat box. And Vazlav and I uh, will do our best to answer your questions. And uh, again, I'll just uh, remind you that these webinars are being recorded so you have access to the recording later on. So now with, uh, for our second part of the practical session we need a, a data set and we've prepared a data set for you so at the top of the handout you see a link here so you can click on it and download the data set uh, if you already have opened your browser and you are on the Lancaster Stats Tools Online webpage, you can click in the materials section and in the first chapter, which is the introduction, you click on data and the same data set is at the end of this list. So you can choose either to use the link at the uh, top of the handout or to find the data set in the materials sections. So we'll start with the first task on page two. As I mentioned before, the aim of this task is to actually become familiar with graph tools so that you can produce your own uh, displays of statistical data. And to, in order to use the graph tool, will open the toolbox in the, on the Lancaster Stats Tools online webpage. So if I click at the top on toolbox, I'll get access to um, graph tools. So in the first chapter, the introduction, if you click on graph tool, you'll be ready to start the practical section with me. And so I'll just, uh, you should, you should have downloaded the data set now, which is an Excel file. So it looks like this. And we'll be using it to create different graphs according to these different data sets. So I'll just flick backwards and forwards um, to show you the handout, the graph tool and the data set. So bear with me. So first of all, the, the, the first task on page two starts with um, an important step that um, refers to preparing our data set. And we already have a, a data set ready for these practical session, uh, just to um, give you some information. So a data set to be used in the, the in the graph tool should be prepared in a tab delimited format, as you can see, as you can read in the handout. 
at the top of page two, for example, using Excel. You should make sure that the data set includes a header row. You can see it here highlighted in orange that includes the names of corpora and subcorpora. And then make sure you include a first column with the text or speaker IDs as well. Um, on the graft, on the Lancaster Stats Tools online webpage, you can also find a manual for a graft tool. Uh, as you can see, I've clicked on graph tool here and I'm in the toolbox section, section of, the, of the website. And if you click on here, you can get help and download the manual in a PDF format. So we'll go through the, these different steps together and we'll start displaying frequency and distribution of data. So we'll use histograms and box plots to display the frequency and the distribution of our data set that we've downloaded. So the, the step that we need to follow next is to input our data in the graph tool. We're going to work with data set one first, and we're going to copy the data, including the header row and the ID column. So I'll just display my data set. This is the Excel file that you should have downloaded. And if you couldn't download it, don't worry, just uh, follow along with me and you'll be able to practice it yourself later on watching the recording of the webinar. So I just select the, uh, the first data set. I make sure I include the header row with the names of the corpora. In this case, it's just one corpus. And the first column with the names of the text, with the text ID. Uh, make sure you include the header row and the first column, but don't include the gray cells. In, that, in this case, I've included these just for clarity purpose for our webinar. So then going back, if you already have your uh, browser open on the graph tool, you can directly paste your data set here or you can click on the link on the handout at step two and it will take you to the same page. So I'll just paste my data set and I have, as you can see, my header row included and the first column. The next step is the selection of the parameters. And in this case, I just have one linguistic variable. So I select one linguistic variable and I want to describe the frequency and the distribution of this variable across my corpus. So I select description as a second parameter. And then I just click on create graph, wait for a few seconds, and I get a histogram to display um, my descriptive data. So at this point, as you, as you have noticed, it's really simple to get your uh, graph. What comes next is the interpretation. So in the handout at the end of page two, you have three questions to think about so that we can interpret these graph together. So I'll just leave you a few seconds, I'll give you a few seconds to think about possible answers for these questions. So what type of information uh, does a, a graph like this include? Why would you use it? What are the advantages and disadvantages? And what can you see from this histogram? What are the main trends and patterns in the data set? Uh, If you get any, while you're thinking about your answers, um, I'll just check the chat box in case anybody has any issues with the graph tool. So if you get an error message that says that there are too many columns at line one, make sure that before the first word, uh, you don't have any space. So if you leave a space, it, it might give you an error. So, and make sure you have highlighted, you have included the header row from your data set and the first column.
Okay, so just another couple of seconds for you to think about the interpretation of these graphs. So somebody is mentioning the fact that a histogram can display the frequency of a linguistic variable. Um, and that's correct, perfect. And somebody else mentioned that you also get an idea of the distribution of your linguistic variable uh, in your data set. That's great. So a histogram um, has a descriptive function and you might have guessed that it is good to explore, initially explore your data set. And uh, it's really interesting that some of you mentioned the, um, that the X axis might be a bit um, artificial or confusing. This is one of the disadvantages of histograms. So we have an artificial division of the, um, of the data into categories, into bins. And I can see that somebody is mentioning that uh, we can tell from a histogram whether the data is normally distributed or skewed, and that's great. So uh, this gives us another function of a, a graph like this. So it helps us select further statistical tests depending on the normality of our data. And graph tool also includes uh, a normality test and some measures of central tendency. So you have the mean and the median. So you can tell that in these cases, we have a positively, positively skewed data set. So uh, you have mentioned some of the uh, aspects typical of uh, histograms. In these cases, it doesn't have a bell shape. Uh, it is not symmetrical about the mean. So we've said that it's, um, it doesn't show a normal distribution of data, but uh, it doesn't give us so many details apart from frequency and distribution. So the next step of our handout at the end of page two says repeat steps two to four with data set two, and these will give us uh, an opportunity to create a box plot together. So I'll show you how to do this. We can do it together or you can uh, work at your own pace and uh, start to go on following the same steps we followed together. So what you need to do now is to highlight data set two. Make sure you highlight the header row, the first column, but not the gray cells with the title of the data set. So I've just highlighted it, copied it. And if I go back to the graph tool, I delete the previous data set and I just paste the new one. And as you can see here, we have now a linguistic variable across three different corpora. So I can leave one linguistic variable and description as a function for the graph. And I just click on create graph to get the new one. And in this case, we have a box plot similar to the one that Vaslov described before during his presentation. So we have um, some more details and I'll ask you again to, I won't give you the answers immediately. I'll ask you to think about the interpretation of these graphs on your own for a few seconds. Uh, look at the three questions in step four again to guide your interpretation. What type of information uh, are included in these graphs? Uh, why would you use it, advantages or disadvantages, and what are the patterns that you can see. So think about possible answers for these questions and um, share your ideas in the chat box.
So we're getting some uh, answers already. Uh, really good points. So as with the previous graph, um, box plots have a descriptive function and they give us uh, details about our data set. Um, you are listing all these details and it's great uh, that you remembered them from uh, the presentation. So you have details about uh, the mean value in each data set, so the red bar, the medium, the median, which is the black long bar here. And you have, um, as, as you have included in your uh, chat, in your answers in the chat box, you have the interquartile range. Which is, this, which is represented by the box itself. And the distance between the maximum and the minimum value uh, and the, the size of the box itself represent the distribution of the data. So it's great to see that somebody is uh, excited about using the graph tool already. And, and you can use um, box plots like this to compare the distribution of um, a linguistic variable across different corpora. So it gives us more details um, and it's more informative than the histogram that we um, created before. Yes, and somebody mentioned that looking at the position of the mean and the median uh, gives us ideas of normality of the distribution. So for example, in the second corpus, the mean and the median are almost overlapping and are in the middle of the box plot. So it gives us an idea of, uh, of a normal distribution of the data. Great. So I'll go on with um, task two, and that's on page three. So if you scroll down on your handout, you'll see that um, in task two, you have a table that gives you, that guides you through the realization of different uh, visualization of data. So you can create different types of descriptive data visualization using this table and the graph tool. We've already created the first two. So the histogram and the box plot, we've used data sets number one and two, and we've used these parameters. So now let's just have a look at a scatter plot. For example, we need to use a uh, data set number four. So I'll Go back to my Excel file, select data set number four, and you can uh, work using your own uh, computer if you have access to a computer and you can create a scatter plot at the same time with me. So just make sure again you select the header row, the first column, but don't include the gray cells at the top. So once you uh, copied the data set, go back to your graph tool, delete the previous uh, data set and paste the new one. So this data set includes um, multiple variables. I have the, the definite article and the personal pronoun and the frequency of use for each speaker. So I now need to select different parameters. Looking at the table in your handout, these should guide you through the selection. So we've got multiple linguistic variables and I want to describe uh, the relationship between these variables. So I leave the second parameter set as description. Then if I click on create graph, I just get a scatter plot. So in this case, um, I'm displaying the relationship between these two variables and I can compare, compare it, uh, especially if I want to create more than one scatter plot. Each circle represents some specific uh, piece of information. In this case, you might have guessed that uh, since I imported different speakers, uh, these different dots represent different speakers. So each dot represents a speaker and gives me information about frequency of use of the article they and the personal pronoun I. And I can try to interpret it and see whether uh, I can see a trend, but I'll show you later on how I can use inferential statistics to actually 
uh, visualize a, a linear trend e more easily. So I'll just check in the chat box if you're all at the same uh, step or if you're having any issues. And again, if you get an error that says you have too many columns, it's because there's something uh, wrong with your selection. There might be um, faces before, maybe at the beginning of the, of the first row. So try again selecting your data. And if you have uh, extra spaces before each row, just delete it. So the table in task two shows you how to create different uh, graphs that are, that all provide descriptive, um, that all have this, a descriptive function and describe your data set. So following this table and the steps that um, are described on the first page and that we've gone through together, you should be able to create a scatter plot matrix to show the relationship between more than two variables, uh, a line chart, a geomapping chart, which is similar to what Baslov showed in, uh, um, in his presentation, a stacked bar chart, a spark line, and a candlestick plot for diachronic data. So I'll leave these, um, these graphs to you. And if you're, if you're curious uh, about the results, downloaded the man downloading the manual also gave, will give you also access to the results and the solutions to the graphs. So we'll just have a look at the third task together now. And this is about inferential data visualization. So since we're running out of time, I'll leave the error bars graph to you and we'll have a look at the scatter plot with, uh, re with a regression line as promised before. So in this case, if we look at the table and follow the uh, instructions, we can see that we, we need to use the same data set as before. So data set number four. So I'll go back and select it and then you can enter it in the chat box. It's still there from my previous scatter plot, so I'll just leave it there. But this time, rather than asking for a description, let's ask for an inference. So we're now using inference statistics. We're trying to make an inference about the population and just clicking on create graph will give us now a scatter plot with a regression line, so a line of the best fit. And in this case, um, we're just trying to in, make an inference about the population and trying to see the relationship between these two variables. So we can see, for example, in this case, that the relationship between the article and the personal pronoun is inversely proportional. So the line of the best fit uh, is uh, an, in, an inference since it, it tries to find, uh, to approximate a linear trend for all the data points that are displayed on the scatter plot. So if you're curious about another um, type of uh, graph to display inferential statistics, you can try and display error bars and follow the uh, instructions on the handout. If you want to use data sets from the BNC, from the British National Corpus, on page four, you can see there's another link where you can download um, data sets from the British National Corpus and following the new, this new table, you can get uh, some more graphs, some more examples. And at the end of the handout, you have the link to the manual and the references that we've used for these uh, webinar and for the practical session. So since we're running out of time now, I'll uh, hand you back to Vasla. And uh, I just want to thank you for following along with me and I hope the graph tool will be useful for your research too. Brilliant, thank, thank you so much, so much Rafael. Uh,
was really, really, really uh, very, very useful. Very useful. And, and uh, hopefully, hopefully people were able to, to, to follow, 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 follow us step by step. step. And, and again, again uh, there's more help of all you available uh, on, on, on the website if you need more, more details and you want to sort of try this in your own time. Uh, there's uh, more material and there are fellow pointed you uh, to, the, to the links that you might like to follow if you are interested in this type of. Uh, tool. Uh, just a few things that I would like to do just in terms of wrapping up this session in you know, about five minutes uh, to, the, to, to the end. I would like to just address some of the questions I noticed both in the Q&A session but also in the uh, chat uh, that were sort of uh, popping up uh, as, as Raphael uh, was guiding, guiding, guiding me through the, through the process. Uh, that uh, one question that popped up fairly, fairly frequently was a question when you get an error message from the, from the graph tool. And someone already recognized that in some uh, language version of Microsoft Excel, there's an automatic conversion of uh, decimal blocks to a, a decimal comma in some languages. Uh, so uh, the graph tool expects the, uh, the, the English formatting of, of the numbers. So, uh, so Dot or a decimal point rather than rather than a comma. So you know, think about whether, whether this this was the whether there was the issue or any extra spaces or any extra tabs that are in that in the data. You would get that you would get an error. Uh, some people already mentioned one one thing that I think is a very important aspect of uh, scientific visualization that is accessibility. Uh, to people, for instance, who are colorblind and you know certain colors do not work that that, that well, but so red green distinction might not be as as, as useful. So having some form of redundancy uh, or uh, the choice of colors uh, that uh, are accessible uh, to all all all. Uh, I think your microphone is muted now, Basla. Okay, sorry. I'm, uh, You're back. The audio is not great. There, there might be some connection, some problems with the connection. Is it, is it, is it better now? Uh, we can we can hear you. It's just not very clear, but. We can hear you. Well, in, in that case, I, I won't be. I won't be talking very, very, very long because we sort of almost reached reached the end and and end of that end, end of the seminar. Uh, so there were many, many very useful points that were raised in uh, the Q and A Q and A session. And uh, obviously, uh, I would just encourage you, you, you know, if you want to sort of uh, follow up on that uh, discussion, uh, we have many different platforms where we can sort of uh, pick up on, on, on these and, you know, you, you made uh, some very, very, very important points. So one of the things that I would like to highlight in the way of uh, finishing this and wrapping up this session is that we have an online course for Corpus Linguists and, and people who are new to Corpus Linguistics as well. Corpus Linguistics Method Analysis and Interpretation that starts on the 21st of September. Rafael is also going to be uh, a tutor on the, on, on, on the course. And there's a lot of space, and much more space that we could uh, devote today uh, to uh, Corpus Linguistics and there will be space to ask further, further questions if you like. So this is a free, completely free course that you can just Join uh, us. Uh, there's, a, there's a link to the course here, and you can Google uh, the, the course as well. Purpose linguistics method analysis and interpretation. And we can then pick up uh, uh, the conversation and have further conversation on corpus linguistics. So, uh, because the, the connection is not not, not, not great, but so far, it, it, you know, it, it was it was stable. Uh, I would just like to thank everyone. Uh, for uh, taking part in this uh, practical webinar and hopefully uh, some of the points that we have discussed today were useful to your particular research context and it's been a great pleasure uh, to, to, to be able to uh, spend these uh, 90 minutes with you guys and again uh, many thanks to the wonderful organizers of the, the, the webinar, Tony and the team.
influence it. So thank you so much for all the time. I hope we see you another opportunity online or hopefully sometime soon offline as well.